a special girl. I got a special girl. Thank you.
Good morning. Welcome to Elm Grove. Come on in. Good morning, Elm Grove family. Welcome to Elm Grove Online. We're honored to host you this morning. We're honored that you would join us. Join with us as we worship and we study the word. We know there's a million things you could be doing today, but we know God's going to bless you for making this time a priority in your life and in your family's life. Here in just a few moments, we're going to go with Blake and Bethany, and they're going to lead us into a time of worship, and then we'll get right into the word. But before we go that, I always like to start off with something just to put a smile on your face. This past week, I heard about a couple who uh, lived together for a number of years, married for a number of years, and all of a sudden, the husband passed away and as he passed away the wife was talking to a friend and she goes you know he left me with twenty thousand dollars and uh now i'm broke and the, the friend said how are you broke with twenty thousand dollars and she said well i spent five thousand dollars on the funeral and fifteen thousand dollars on the memorial stone and the friend said wow that that must be an incredible memorial stone how big is it and she held up her hand and she said, it's three and a half carats. Come on. That's good right there. Hey, again, we want to welcome you this morning. Welcome to Elm Grove Online. Before we go into a time of worship, uh, we just want to first start off by thanking our community. Here a little over a week ago, we held our drive through uh, barbecue rib dinner night. It was different than anything we've ever hosted before, but it was a huge success. We did not have one piece of meat or one crumb of cornbread or one pinto bean left over. Everything was gone at the end of the night as people drove through, got to go boxes, and man, it was just an incredible night together. So I want to say thank you to our community. Thank you to all those who came out and just made that uh, time just an incredible night, hopefully for our community and we know for us at Elm Grove. So thank Thank you so much for allowing us the opportunity to serve you in that. Hey, if you're looking to give this morning, we just want to encourage you, go to our website, go to elmgrovecc.org, elmgrovecc.org, and you'll find the giving links there if you want to give online, or if you want to send it through the mail, you can go to our website and you'll find our address there as well. There's also a link if you're watching our online platform, uh, elm, elmgrove.online.church. There's a link there. So just go and click on that link and that'll take you uh, to an opportunity to give as well. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for your faithfulness and your praying and your giving and your serving as we try to represent our very best, uh, the reflection of Jesus Christ to an awesome and amazing community. So God bless you guys. Hey, also, if you'll go to elmgrovecc.org, go to our website, there's going to be a pop-up link there that talks about our app. We now have an app for Elm Grove that you can put on your phone. So go to elmgrovecc.org, all lowercase, wait for the pop-up, it'll come up. And it'll ask you if you want to download the app. And it'll ask you if you want to make Elm Grove Community Church your home church. Just hit yes. And then also allow push notifications on that so we can send out information to you. Man, it's going to be an awesome tool, an awesome resource for our church. Not only in this season, but for the great season that is to come. And so I look forward to that. Again, hey, thanks for joining us today. We love you guys. Let's go right now to Blake and Bethany. Come on, get up on your feet. This is a day the Lord has made. We're going to rejoice right Right there in our living rooms and our bedrooms and our kitchens and in our cars. We're going to rejoice and be glad in it. Come on, worship with us this morning. Good morning, Elm Grove and beyond. Welcome to our worship service this morning. Uh, we're going to sing a few songs, uh, get you in the spirit. And uh, the first one that we're going to do is going to cast off the fear. There's a lot of people living in fear presently. And uh, that has no place in our lives. And so the first one, first song is called My Fear Doesn't Stand a Chance. When darkness tries to roll over my bones, when sorrow tries to steal the joy I am When brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand 
stand a chance when I stand in your love, my fear. It doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Oh, shame no longer has a place to hide.
church family and also to those who are listening by way of simoncast or those who are watching us for the first time my name is orville white one of three on our pastoral staff here at one of god's greatest church families in all the world the young Grove community church is located 10 miles north of ceiling three west and a half mile north it's such a privilege today to say hello to this awesome listening audience and to remind you that god loves you and so do we we're living in a time that that most of us have never witnessed. And I would be the first to admit that I don't have all the answers to life's questions. Many things are coming our way today that forces us to change our way of doing business. But one thing I can say with great confidence, Jesus Christ has not changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. To our church family and to our listening audience, God loves you, he cares for you, and he tells us that he will never leave us nor forsake us, but will go with us always, even to the end of life journey. If you have a need in your life today and would like to, for one of our pastoral staff members to pray with you, Pastor Jerry Cloud, Pastor Barry Prock, or myself, Orville White, can be reached at this phone number, 580-764-3514. May God's richest blessings be with you today as we continue to put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning, Elm Grove family and Elm Grove Online. What an honor to host you this morning. Uh, actually, you're hosting us this morning. You're hosting us into your life. We know many are gathered in living rooms, some in bedrooms, around the kitchen table, some maybe in your vehicle as you're listening on your mobile device, uh, others. I, I know we had a report last week of a lady who was out in her front yard and in her robe, uh, trying to get a better internet signal so she could stay up with us and stay in real time with us there online. And so uh, in whatever way, shape, or form or format you're watching us today, we want to say thank you so much. Thank you for uh, investing uh, this time into you and your family's life. We know you're hungry for the Word of God, and we want to say thank you, Elm Grove family, for just that awesome desire to be a part of Elm Grove Online during these days. Uh, your dedication uh, to the Word and to the Lord is, is re remarkable, and it's an honor honor to, to be a leader in this church family. So, Elm Grove family, we love you and look forward to a, to a great time together today. Now, if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 27. You can turn there you can click there on your phone, on your computer. Maybe you tell Alexa, go to Matthew 27, whatever you do. But go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 27 as we continue in our series, Famous Last Words. Uh, I, I believe this series is going to have a real impact 
upon our life in a very significant way as we look through some of the things that Jesus said while he was dying upon the cross. And I thought it would be very meaningful for us if we went and we just kind of examined those phrases. In week one, we talked about Father, forgive them. Uh, last week, uh, Pastor Barry, he brought forth a, a woman, behold thy son. It's Jesus hanging on the cross and he looks down and he uh, he notices Mary. And he wants to make sure that, that Mary is aware of that notification. And so uh, he brought a great, great word uh, in that last week in our first online service. And so uh, today we're going to continue on. And so Matthew chapter 27, verse 37 is where we're going to begin. And I just kind of want to give you some context here today uh, as we look into this word. Jesus, he's hanging on the cross. And the Bible says that above Jesus' head, they had placed uh, the written charge against him. And the written charge against him was, this is Jesus, King of the Jews. Okay, that's what the sign said that was hanging above his head. And they are mocking him. They're saying, yeah, yeah, whatever. You said this. And so now since you said this, you're going to have to own this. Have you ever said anything that now you have to own? Well, now Jesus has said he's the king of the Jews. And now they're making fun of him, trying to make him own this. In verse 38, uh, two robbers were crucified with him, one on the left and one on the right. Okay, And we're going to look here in a few weeks at the lives of those two robbers and what that means to us. So you don't want to miss that the week after Easter, I believe. So be sure and check that out. But then in verse 39, it says this. Those who passed by hurled insults at him. They hurled insults at Jesus, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days. You, you said that. So why don't you save yourself? Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. You can just kind of hear the mockery in their voice. They were quoting actually what he had said earlier because he told them, if you destroy this temple, I'll raise it back to life in three days. And so now they're saying, hey, go get it, big boy. Okay, that's, that's, that's what they're saying. Go do it. You said you're going to do it. Go do it. Where is your God in the middle of this time? Verse 41. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders, they all mocked him. And everyone's getting in on this party, right? He saved others, but he can't even save himself. He is king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. And I want you to hold on to these next four words, okay? Pay attention, lean in, and listen to these next four words. He trusts in God. Okay, I, I want you to lean in on that. He trusts in God. Everybody said right where you're at, sitting on your couch, sitting on your bedside, sitting around the kitchen table, driving down the road, out in your front yard, in your road. Okay, say it. He trusts in God. They're asking, where is your God? Okay, with all this going on, man, where is your God? You still going to trust God in the midst of all this? I mean, when you're hanging there on the cross, man, we've done our worst to you. You are bloodied and beaten and battered and bruised. And you still going to trust God? <laughs> he trusts in God. Verse 43. Let God rescue him now if he wants. For he said, I am the son of God. Where is your God now? He trusts in God. God. He trusts in God. Now, let's be honest real quick. If we were there and we're watching Jesus hang up on this cross like, like they did, what would we have thought? What would have been going through our mind? We, we, we might be asking the same thing. Where, where's God? How many times have you thought that over the last couple of weeks? Where is God now? Where is God in the midst of this pandemic? Where is God in the midst of all of the things that's going on, not only in our community or not only in our state, not only in our nation, but in our world? God, where are you now? He trusts in God. Where is his God now? I don't know about you, but I've read that on social media. I've, I've, I've seen that through media outlets, through news outlets. 
I've, 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 I've read articles where people are poking fun at Christians and just saying, hey, in the midst of all this, where's your God now? Okay? Where's your God now? But if you would have seen Jesus, if you would have seen him on this day, you probably would have been deeply disturbed. Because the scriptures tells us very clearly what they did to Jesus. They beat him and abused him so severely that he didn't even look like a human being. He looked more like an animal. Think about this. They took his shirt off. They took his clothes off. And with 39 lashes of the cat of nine tails, they went across his body. The cat of nine tails was a whip that was made of glass, metal, rocks, uh, hard objects, hard things. They'd intertwine that with the, the leather straps. And they would take that and they'd lash that across your body. And when they hit it across your body, it was made in such a way that those objects would penetrate your skin, penetrate your body, penetrate as far as they could, grab hold. And then the, 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 the guards who were trained in this knew just how to rip that back where it would pull the most flesh and the, the, do the most damage. He took that 39 times. In fact, a lot of scholars tell us that with 39 lashes, with that cat and nine tails, his internal organs would have been exposed a horrible 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 sight they blindfolded him and they took their big signet rings now these rings make super bowl championship rings look small but the guards took their big signet rings and they pounded him in the face and they hit him in the face and they cried out and said prophesy tell us who hit you right so they beat him and they said okay which one of us did that if you're the son of god tell us his face was black and blue and bloodied. And then they took a crown of thorns and they didn't just place it on his head. The Bible says they placed it upon his brow. They shoved it down in his head. And we're not talking little bitty thorns. We're talking big, thick, long thorns that the thorns would dive into the skull. And they shoved it into his head. They began to make fun of him. They kicked him again and again. They spit on him. They mocked him. Creation took the creator and they laid him down on a piece of wood and they drove stakes through his hands and through his heels. History tells us that they uh, to crucify someone, they, they stripped them down naked. And so there he is, looking more like an animal than he is a man, hanging up on the cross, bruised, bruised and bloodied and battered and broken for you and for me. And they ask him, you trust in God? You trust in God now? You believe in God now? Where is your God? He still trusts God. Now, the root word here that's translated as trust is a portion in Scripture. And this portion of Scripture is, is actually the word P-E-I-T-H-O. It's pronounced pytho. P-E-I-T-H-O. And it means to convince or to rely on an inward certainty to have full confidence and complete trust. You still trust God? You still have confidence in God? You still rely with all that inward certainty? Are you sure about your God? How many times have you heard that over the last couple of weeks? You see, because it's very, very easy to trust God when things are going well. But for many of us, come on, let's just be really real today. It's really difficult to trust God when life goes dark. And all of a sudden, we have to answer a question that every single one of us, every single one who's listening to this cast right now, every single one of us is going to have to answer at some point in our life. And that question is, do you really trust God? Do you really trust God? Growing up, I lived on a, on a farm. On that farm, uh, we raised cattle and we raised show pigs and uh, my dad was an ag teacher for many, many years. So I, I grew up in the, the farm life and, and man, really enjoyed that. But I remember when I got home, I played sports all through school. And so when I'd get home from a basketball game or a baseball game or an after school activity, uh, I still had to go take care of the animals. We still had to go feed and water and hay and, and break ice or do whatever we had to do. We still had to take care of the animals. And, uh, it didn't matter if it was light, and it didn't matter if it was dark outside. And I want to tell you something. In the backwood hills outside of Haleyville, Oklahoma, 
I've had many close encounters with Bigfoot, Jimmy Hoffa, and rabbit flesh eating squirrels. I can tell you that right now without a doubt. As I cared for these animals in the dark, man, there were some weird things that went on outside between Haleyville and Dow Lake. But most of those times of being out there in the dark when it was, when it was dark time, uh, Dad, he would go out there with me. And I knew that. I knew Dad was there with me. And I knew that all I had to do was call on Dad and he would come. He would be right there. But there is something about being in the dark that just kind of makes you lose understanding, doesn't it? There's something about being in the dark that turns like a gust of wind that's rustling the leaves into, oh no, a zombie apocalypse is happening and it's starting right here in the hog barns of Haleyville, right? I mean, it's just, just something about those moments that just makes you lose all understanding. And in darkness, our minds run crazy. Come on, let's be real. Our minds go crazy. And here's what the Bible says about this time upon the cross. Matthew 27, 45, 46. It says, from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. Midnight darkness at midday. It was as if God was saying, you know what? I'm not going to let the sun shine on what's about to happen. I ain't going to go down like that. Now about the ninth hour, it says, Jesus cried out in a loud voice. In the Greek language, as you study this, this means he wasn't just crying out. He was screaming, screaming in agony and screaming with everything he's got. He has endured. I want you to catch this. He's endured all of the abuse of men without complaining. Not one complaint uttered from his mouth. But the moment that God withdraws his presence, he screams out. And this is what we're honing in on today. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why for, well, have you forsaken me? Not one time did he complain when men did their worst, but when God withdrew his presence, he screams out in agony. I can't take it. God, why? Why have you forsaken me? Now, I want you to catch this. All throughout the Gospels, Jesus referred to God as his Father his Abba, his daddy. But at this moment, something happened. Now, I don't know exactly what it is, but instead of saying daddy, instead of saying Abba, instead of saying Papa, instead of saying Father, he cries out, my God, my God, why? This is perhaps one of the saddest scriptures, one of the saddest verses in all of the word of God. And unquestionably, it's one of the most confusing as well. Martin Luther, he said centuries ago, he said, how can God forsake God? Because that, that's what's happening here. And that answer, I'll be honest, I don't know. How can God forsake God? I can't explain it. There are so many theological questions that I can't even begin to answer by this one statement of Jesus. I mean, Jesus had to know, right? I mean, he was God, so he had to know. Surely he knew what was coming and all of the questions that Jesus could have asked while he's hanging up on the cross, all the things that he could have said as he's hanging up on the cross, this one question he embraces. This one question he embraces. Why? Because he knew at some point in our life we're going to ask the exact same question. We're going to embrace and we're going to wrestle with this exact same question. When things go dark in our life, we're going to ask, this question. Some of us might be there right now as we look around and see what's happening in our world. Some of us, we may have been here long before this pandemic ever hit because of situations and circumstances that were happening in our life, happening in relationships, happening in marriages, happening on, happening on the job site, happening in our finances, happening in our health, whatever happening with our dreams, happening with our plans, happening with our purposes. We're all going to wrestle with this question. We're all going to embrace this question. My God, my God, why? We all ask the whys. Why did, why did my seemingly fairy tale marriage end up like a Stephen King novel? Why did my company just call and say they had to make some cuts and I was on that list? Why did we lose our baby the way we did? Why did my loved one pass away too young? Or why did my loved one pass away so suddenly and so quickly? 
Why did this opportunity that I had not work out? Why did the test results come back positive after we prayed and we prayed and we, God, we just, we just knew as, you know, God, why? Why did our lives come to a screeching halt? Why was I abused the way I was when I was a kid? Or why am I abused the way I am in this relationship that I'm currently in? God, why? And that's where we all live at some point, some time in our life. We ask that question. We ask that question, God, why? I don't understand. And the reality is we have to understand that we're not always going to understand. Did you catch that? We're, we have to understand that we're not always going to understand. And that's true. Because we on this earth, we see part of the story. We can't understand everything from God's perspective. In fact, Paul writes this and he states this very clearly in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12. He says, now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror, but then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall be known fully. Talk about when we see the Lord, even as, a, as I am known fully. I don't understand it right now, Jared. I don't understand why I'm walking through this. I don't understand why I'm going through this. I don't understand why these things are happening around me. It's a little bit like, like this. If, if I held up this sign right here, can you read that? And I was to ask you about this sign right here. I was to say, all right, guys. What two words do you see right here in this sign? Many of you, you would say, I see nowhere. I see nowhere. Some of you, you would say, no, wait, wait, wait a second. I see now here. Okay. Now, what, what separates the two? What separates the nowhere and the now here? Well, it's all how we view the beginning. In the beginning, do we view no? Or do we view now? Okay? It's all in the way we view the beginning. Is this nowhere? Or is this now here? All right, hang on. We're about to preach. So in that sign, we only see what we see at the beginning. And the way we see it at the beginning develops how we read the whole word in its entirety. And a lot of people at hard times and dark moments of their life they're saying God is nowhere to be found. Okay, God is nowhere to be found. I don't see God nowhere. But others who have placed their faith and their trust and they have been rooted and grounded in the word of God, they say, no, he's, he's not nowhere. He's now here. Because the way we entered into the situation, the way we entered into the circumstance, the way we entered into this life-changing moment determines how we're going to view it in its entirety. And right now is the best time for us to come together and to view this life-changing moment, whether it be personally or nationally or globally. And we've got to get rooted and founded in the Word of God. So we're not saying, you know what, God's nowhere. No, no, no. We're the church of Jesus Christ. And God is now here. Come on, shout right where you're at. God is now here with us. He's Emmanuel. He's God with us. Come on, somebody. That's good preaching right there. Amen. Amen. Now, my daughter, Jaxie, she busted her eye wide open several years ago in a horrible accident uh, involving a fireplace at a youth camp that we were taking some of our students to in Enid. And the fireplace won the battle. And right above, right above her eye right here, there's still a scar where she had just, I mean, it was just a, a bad, bad situation. She tripped, she fell, smell, uh, fell smack into the side of, of that corner of the fireplace. And of course, we had to go to the emergency room and, and had to get stitches. And I'll never forget the frustration that I felt as a father. As we're in that emergency room, uh, her and my wife and I, and she's never got stitches before. And you can just imagine a young, young girl. She's so young, and, and they're coming at you with a needle and thread. And so she's, of course, she's, she's shaking, and of course she's scared, and of course she's looking at us, going, what in the world are they about to do? And, and she's laying there flat on, on that bed, and the doctor moves up to her head, and he says, Dad, I need you to hold her arms. And I'm, I'm like, oh, <laughs> 
What, what are you talking about, Willis? Right? I, 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 I don't know about this. Dad, I need you to hold her arms. And as I began to hold her arms, I can remember seeing in her eyes just that fear. Like, Dad, why are you doing this? Dad, why are you holding my arms down? And she wasn't like flipping out. She wasn't screaming. She wasn't throwing herself everywhere. But the doctor just wanted to make sure as he began making the stitches that she wasn't able to intrude upon what she was doing. And he said, Dad, I need you to hold down her arms. And I just remember thinking, man, she is incapable. If I even, even tried to explain this to her as a young, young girl, she's incapable of understanding why I'm having to do what I'm having to do. Sometimes as followers of Christ, with God as our Father, can I be real? We're incapable of understanding what God and His divine purposes is doing in our life, especially in our pain. Especially in our pain. He's not the author of it. I want you to get that. I want you to grab that. I want you to know that God is not the author of your pain. But man, through it, He'll sure use that to make the devil regret that he ever brought that pain into your life. You come out on the other side stronger than what you ever went in. And here's what God says in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8 through 9, it said, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. But the good news is, is that God's word gives us something that we can remember even when we don't understand, when we don't understand why we're going through what we're going through, even when we're asking the questions why, okay, there's some things that we can remember as children of the living God. And I just want you to say this with me. I want you to declare this with me. Say, God is good. Come on. God is good. And also, God is for me. Say it with me. God is for me. And then also say, God is with me. Come on, say, God is with me. So how do we get in the place in our life from where we say, you know what, God is nowhere to now, God is now here. How do we make that transition? How do we go from believing that God's nowhere to be found to know God is now here and knowing without a shadow of a doubt who God is? Listen, in life, curveballs come at us. Things change. So how do we get from nowhere to now here? In every life, the wind blows directions. And those storms of life begin to blow. And the challenge and the curveballs and the betrayals and the things that you never expected, all of a sudden holding on to who God is, can leave you with like white knuckles and worn out muscles. Come on, spiritually. And today, we're going to hold on to an unchanging and an immovable God. And we're going to remember, number one, that God is good. Say that with me. God is good. In fact, Mark chapter 10, verse 18 says, No one is good except God alone. No one is good except God alone. He is good. Now, here's why that's so important. Because we tend to project our present situation upon God. And when we're confused and we and things are happening that we don't understand, uh, a lot of us, I, I've been guilty of it myself. So I'm not throwing anything out there that I haven't walked through. I've been guilty of it myself. You get in a place and you go, you know what? I don't get it. God, where are you? God, where are you at? When things are bad, sometimes we think, you know, things are bad. Maybe God's not good. Things are bad. Maybe God's not good. But I want you to know this. Our God transcends circumstances. Okay? Our God transcends circumstances. Just the other day, I was down at our local grocery store here in town and, and uh, just walking through kind of the aisles and seeing what all was left after some of the, the, the rushes that came in. You know, the, the, all, all the rushes right after all this uh, stuff began and and uh, as I was walking through the aisles, I was just looking to my left, I was looking to my right, and uh, uh, my favorite spaghetti, you know, uh, they were out of my favorite spaghetti. You know, I'm like, man, they don't even have my favorite spaghetti, they're out of that. And I just begin to kind of throw yourself a pity party, you might know what I'm talking about. And you begin to throw yourself a pity party, going, man, what, what if this happens, what if this happens, what if that happens? And, 
And as I was walking the aisles, it was just like the Lord just stopped me in my tracks. And, and I began to look and I began to see all the food that we did have, that our local grocery store and the awesome people that own and work there, all the things that they did have out. And I just began to think, you know what? There's so many people across this nation right now. And there's so many people across our world right now who if they came to a grocery store that was filled with all of this food that we still have, they would feel like they're in heaven already. And so I begin to look at those things. I begin to say, you know what, God? We may not have everything right now, but we got more than enough. God, look at all the stuff we do have. And I just begin to change that worry into worship and kind of that panic into praise. And I just begin to say, God, I, I'm, I'm thankful. I'm grateful. Look at what we do have. Look at what you are doing. Look at what our town is blessed with. Look at what the community has. And, and, and it just begin to change my perspective. And I, I want to challenge you instead of focus on what you don't have or focus on your, your need. I want you to focus on what you do have. Focus on what's in your hand. Focus on what God has blessed you with. What God has put inside of you. And I, I want you to look at that. And I just begin to look at all that stuff. And I'm going, you know what? There's this and there's that and there's that. Man, God is still good. And I begin to get happy right there in the midst of our grocery store because God is good. Man, I want you to say it. God is good. He's good not just today and not just tonight and not just tomorrow, but He's good forever and ever and ever. Uh, we we, we, we got to get that. And that will never change. God is Good. He's always good. And the second thing I want you to know, not only is God good, but God is for you. God is for you and God is for me. In fact, Romans 8.31, Paul writes, if God is for us, who can be against us? Now, I want you to think about how ridiculous this idea is. It is unbelievable. The God who authored everything. The Bible says he's the Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He's the great I Am. He breathed the stars into space. And yet scripture says this same God is for you. The all powerful God is your advocate. He believes in you. He has a dream for you. He has a purpose for you. He has a plan for you. And it's beyond all the confusion that we're living in today. He, that all this stuff that's happened has not changed the plan of God. Has not changed the purpose of God. And it has not changed the power of God. He's still an all powerful God. And this same God is for you. Come on somebody. Say amen. He's for you and you hold on to that we remember that God is good that God is for us and then finally remember Hebrews 13 5 never will I leave you and never will I forsake you God is good he's for us and he's with us never will I leave you that's good news not even in a pandemic that's good news not even in in, in when, when life is going crazy, that's good news. Even when you can't find a roll of toilet paper on the shelf, I'm still with you. That's great news. God's promise, he will never leave us and he will never forsake us. As Jesus is hanging up on the cross, God the Father forsook his son so that he would never have to forsake us. Grab hold of that. As Jesus is hanging up on the cross, he said, God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God the Father forsook his son so that he would never have to forsake you or me. Wow. So the question I would ask you is this. Do you trust God? Because it's easy to trust God in light, but it's more difficult to trust God in the dark. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6 says, We are to trust in the Lord with all of our heart and lean not on our own understanding. We're not going to understand everything, but it says this, In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will make your paths straight. The word in Hebrew that's translated as acknowledge is the word yada, Y-A-D-A. And very literally, it means to know. In all your ways, know God. In all you do, know God. Even when you don't understand, know God. And He will make your paths straight. And here's what you'll find in life. Here's what I've found in life. The better we know God, 
the less I ask why and the more I ask what. The less I ask why and the more I ask what. Instead of asking God, why is this going on in my life? God, why is this happening? I ask God, what? What can I learn from this? God, what is it that you can teach me through this? And what can I do in this to get to know you even more? God, what are you doing? Help me to see you in the midst of all this, God. Help me to see you. Help me to see your plan. Help me to see your purpose. God, I'm not asking why. I'm asking what? Because God is not nowhere. God is now here. And I believe that with all my heart. You may ask, well, why did God have to forsake Jesus? As Jesus cries out, why have you forsaken me? Why did God have to do that? Well, that answer is in Scripture. It's found in Corinthians, first, second Corinthians chapter 5, 21. It says, God made him, who's him? Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Again, God forsook his son so that he would never forsake us. On the cross, murder and adultery and adultery and lying and lust and pride and arrogance and pornography and cheating and racism and hatred and every sin that has ever existed and every, ever will exist in this world. Jesus became sin and God had to look away. Because his eyes are too righteous to look upon sin. He died for our sin so that our sins might be forgiven. And when everyone else around the cross, there on that day, they didn't understand. And they kept hurling insults and mocking Jesus. They didn't get it. But now we do. God made him sin so that we can become the sons and daughters of God. No matter what you're going through, never ever forget, God is good. He is good. He is for you, and He is with you, even in the darkest moments of our life. Let's pray together. God, we find great comfort right now in the words of your Son, Jesus. Even God, when He asked why, we see your divine hand. And your purpose leading every step of the way. So help us, God, to trust you and to trust you completely, to know you and to trust you. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. This morning, as you're praying today, I'm going to ask you, if you're in a difficult place right now, and you would say, Pastor Jared, I really do need some prayer. It's pretty dark around here. And I need some prayer today. I would really love to pray with you. And I mean that with all my heart. It'd be an honor. And so if you wouldn't mind, if you're watching on our online service, there's a request prayer button. You can click that and you can connect with us and we will pray with you and we will get with you today on that. We'll get with you right now. If you want to go to our Facebook and send us a message, just a private message, or, or if you want to call our church off, it's 580-764-3514. Uh, we would love the opportunity to be with you during this time every step of the way. It would be an honor to pray with you. And so God, I, I, I thank you. I thank you that you know the details of the situation that's facing our community, that's facing our nation, and facing our world. And God, I also thank you that you know the details of every situation that's facing every individual right now who's watching or who's listening today. So God, as, as painful sometimes as life can be, we acknowledge it sometime in those lonely times of questioning that you become all we have. And God, that's when we realize most you're all we need. And so God, I pray in this season of questioning, I pray that your presence would be enough, that right now your Holy Spirit would touch every hurting heart, God, that your peace that goes beyond our understanding would guard our hearts and our minds and our souls in Jesus Christ. And God, I pray today that we can fully and 100% trust, rely, and, and, and give our life completely to you. In Jesus' name. As you continue praying right where you're at, 
There's some of you that might say right now, you say, you know what, I'm, I'm so hurting and I'm so scared, I don't even know where to begin right now. I don't even know what to do. I don't even know where to turn. And right now you just feel so low. I want you to know that when you're at your lowest is when God's at his highest. That's when God can reach down and grab hold of you and pick you up out of that miry clay. And the Bible says that we're to cast all of our cares on him because he cares for us. And maybe right now you're like, Jared, my whole life is just full of cares, full of burdens, full of worries, full of stress, full of anxiety, full of doubt, full of fear, full of despair. Well, we believe today you can be full of hope. You can be full of joy. You can be full of peace. You can be full of love. You can be full of purpose. You can be full of, of that power, and that spirit of the living God. Others of you, you might be watching, you're like, you know what? I feel so guilty. I feel so unworthy because of all the things I've done against the heart of God. Jared, I just, I don't know if God could ever love someone as bad as I. Well, I want you to know Jesus was forsaken so that we could be forgiven. Jesus was forsaken so that we would never have to be. God judged sin on the cross. And now anyone, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord can be saved. And so if you're here this morning, you're watching this cast or you're watching a, whatever stream it might be, whatever outlet you might be listening or watching on, and you would say, Jared, I just, I need to get things right with the Lord today. I want to invite Jesus Christ into my life. Then it's my honor to say this simple prayer with you, to lead you in this prayer. And I'm going to ask you just right where you're at, just repeat this prayer after me. And we believe today that God is changing your life. Just say, Jesus, I invite you into my life to be my Lord and Savior. Forgive me of all my sin." As I place my faith in you. Today, I choose you because on the cross, you chose me. Help me live out my new faith and be a light to those around me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, at all of our online platforms today, those of you who say, you know what, I'm calling on Jesus. I'm giving my heart to Jesus, or I'm rededicating my life to Jesus. There's also a link there on our online church. You can click, click that link. We want to know about it. Or again, go to our Facebook, go to our website, give us a call. We want to know about it, okay? We want to cheer you on. Uh, we we want to encourage you in this journey. So be sure and let us know. God said it's not good for man to be alone, to live alone. And we want to make sure that you're not living all this faith on your own as always but we want to make it especially clear on a day like today right now in this time we're here at elm grove to serve you if there's anything you need in your life we'll do whatever we can as a church family to help you in that area of need we want to say thank you for joining us today at our online church thank you for joining us as we navigate through this new season but it's just that it's just a season and soon and very soon, we're going to join together again. And we're going to celebrate together with food. Yes, all of God's goodness and all of God's faithfulness. Okay, it's going to be an awesome, awesome day. Elm Grove family, to all those who are watching, we love you guys. Thanks for joining us at Elm Grove Online today. We are and always will be a church that is close at heart even when we're far apart. God bless you guys. Thanks for inviting me into your homes today.